Hello, and welcome to this particular discussion. Uh, we shall be talking about the thymic neoplasms, but in that process, we shall be talking a little bit about uh, the normal thymic histology, along with uh, a little bit about grossing, the various staging systems of thymic neoplasms, and uh, mostly concentrating on the histological nuances of the various type of thymic epithelial neoplasms that we get to see, and end the discussion with a, lit with a small discussion on uh, molecular genetics in the workup of thymic epithelial neoplasms. So this particular slide uh, is a virtual slide grab, screen grab uh, of a pediatric thymus. The pediatric thymus is the prototypical example based on which you, you analyze your usual thymomas because the kind of organoid architecture that the pediatric thymus shows, most of your type B1 thymomas tend to recapitulate that. Now, what does uh, so what does this particular organoid configuration mean? If you look at the pediatric thymus, you tend to have a fibrous capsule at the external surface, which can be sometimes thin, and you have a lobular kind of an architecture of the thymus. And by this lobular configuration, I mean that you have these large nodules spread throughout the thymic parenchyma, which are separated by fibrous septae. Now, if you look at the thymic histology over here, you're seeing that there are two zones, basically. You have got an outer zone, which is kind of dark, and that's the cortex, and you've got the inner zone, which is composed of slightly spaced apart cells giving rise to a paler appearance, and that is the medulla. Now, in the cortex, there's a little bit of a starry sky kind of a pattern, and as you understand, the, the starry sky kind of a pattern means there's a lot of proliferative activity going on, so there are lots of sheets of immature lymphoid cells over there in the cortex. And these immature cells will have the same immunophenotype as that, as you see in the case of T-acute lymphoblastic lymphoma. So the cells will express CD3 along with TDT and other immature T-cell markers. So this is a high power view of the thymic cortex. You have your usually immature T-cells which, uh, which express CD1A CD99, CD3, and nuclear TDT. And you have got these macrophages, which are actually responsible for the starry sky kind of a pattern. So they would stain with CD68 and CD163. And moving over towards the region of the medulla, you see that the lymphocytes are a little bit more spaced apart, as a result giving rise to a pale kind of an appearance. And you have this slightly larger polygonal cells, which are sitting over there. So these are the thymic epithelial cells that is the reticular epithelial cells. So you have an intimate admixture of the polygonal epithelial cells. By the way, the polygonal epithelial cells can are also seen in the thymic cortex, but the representation is slightly more towards the region of the medulla. And so these larger polygonal cells are actually your thymic epithelial cells. And you have got these lymphocytes in the background which are a little bit less crowded compared to what you see in the case of the thymic cortex. So these reticular epithelial cells with, will stain with a whole lot of epithelial markers. So they will stain with pancytokeratin. So the usual pancytokeratin is the AE1-A3 clone, out of which the AE1 is the antibody which basically recognizes these thymic epithelial cells. Low molecular weight cytokeratins like CK818, that is the CAM 5.2, also picks up these cells. CK19, P63, P40, etc. can also be utilized to stay in these particular cells. And sometimes they'll show expression of EMA, BCL2, and CD57. You also see a smattering of mast cells in the background. So these are your larger polygonal epithelial cells, which look almost squamoid. However, unlike the usual squamous cells, they don't show intercytoplasmic intercellular bridging. And with the passage of time, with, with progression of age, what happens is these epithelial cells become more prominent, more clustered, rounded, with, an, with a polygonal almost squamoid appearance with evidence of keratinization at the periphery, giving rise to what is known as the Hassel's corpuscles. So the pediatric thymus is what we have seen, but if you were to see a thymus in an older adult, you'd see that the cortical zones are involuted. There is a more prominent proliferation of this medullary zone with a very flooded proliferation of the Hassel's corpuses, something you wouldn't be able to appreciate in the very young age group. Now, let's talk a little bit in detail about the thymic epithelial neoplasms. We shall be concentrating first 
on the names of the various histotypes of the thymic neoplasms. If you see, there has been a hist there has been a kind of an evolution as far as the nomenclature of the thymic epithelial neoplasms is concerned. So you had the older classification schemes. There is the Bernard scheme, the muller hubling scheme, the suster moran classification scheme, and the classification scheme that is followed off late. In fact, it has been followed for quite some time now is the WHO classification scheme. And this divides the thymic epithelial neoplasms into type A, AB, B1, B2, and B3. So these are the various categories of thymoma that you see. And the thymic carcinoma is also included in the WHO classification as a separate nomenclature. So when, we, so when you are talking about A, AB, B1, B2, and B3, you're basically talking about the thymoma subtypes. So a little bit about the general properties of thymomas. They account for around 80% of all the mediastinal tumors. Majority of the mediastinal tumors will be thymomas. A small portion of them will also be thymic carcinomas, around 20%. And even rarer are the thymic neuroendocrine tumors. The thymomas are usually sporadic, but they can be sometimes familial as in the case of Lynch syndrome, MEN1, etc. As far as these various categories are concerned, A, A, B, B1, B2, and B3, the type of the thymic category of the thymoma is important because it's got a prognostic relevance. So if you're talking about the A, A, B, and the B1 categories, these have got a prognostically good, uh, a good prognostic significance. So the 10-year overall survival in these particular cases would go up to 80 to 100%. On the other hand, if you go on to the B2 and the B3 subtypes, the prognosis is not as good. The 10-year survival is around 60 to 80 percent. And for thymic carcinoma and neuroendocrine tumors, it's even lesser. Now, the cases can actually be symptomatic or asymptomatic. The symptomatic ones are those which would present due to mass effect, compression, or due to autoimmune associated, autoimmunity associated symptoms like myasthenia gravis. And this kind of myasthenia gravis like features can actually develop in the pre or in the post-operative state. The patient can also actually present with B and T cell associated secondary immunodeficiencies. Now the CT scan evaluation is a routine part of the picture in the workup of the thymomas. And on CT, you usually see it as a well-defined circumscribed and lobulated homogeneous tumor, sometimes with some amount of cystic change. There can also be invasion into the surrounding tissue sometimes. And this is very important because this forms the basis for the staging systems of the thymic epithelial neoplasms. The staging system that was originally devised was the Masaoka staging system, which was further modified by Koga. So the modified Masaoka staging system is actually the Masaoka Koga staging system. And as you see in the pictures below, like where the arrows point, you are having mediastinal plural invasion by this thymic tumor, which is shown by M. Okay. And you have got pericardial invasion in the next set of pictures, which is showing invasion of the pericardium in contiguity with the thymic neoplasm. Now we'll have to talk a little bit in detail about the staging systems because this is important when a, uh, in the course of the PG discussions during your exams, you'll be asked about the staging systems. So we shall start off with the tried and tested Masaoka Koga staging system. You have to keep in mind though, that the Masaoka Koga staging system was actually initially uh, utilized for the purpose of subcategorizing the various categories, the various stages of the epithelial neoplasms of the thymus. But of late, the tendency has been, the trend has been to shift this particular staging terminologies onto the TNM system. Now, as far as the treatment protocols are concerned, the Masaoka Koga staging system is good enough. You don't really need the TNM system for that, but it is increasingly advocated that you shift over from the Masaoka Koga staging system to the TNM. So we shall be talking about the TNM subsequently, and we shall see that the TNM staging system and the Masaoka Koga staging system approaches the thymic tumors from a certain standpoint, which is to some extent similar, but also not always the same. Now let's look at this Masaoka Koga staging system first. As you see in the stage one, you have got a tumor which is very, very well encapsulated. There is no tumoral invasion of this, of this capsule. As you move on to the stage 2A, you have the tumor coming out in the form of a small bud. So you have got a transcapsular invasion, and that's important to note 
when you are grossing. Most importantly, you will often not be able to identify it grossly. You will have to make a note of it in your microscopic findings though, because that would upstage your tumor. Moving on to the stage B, that is the stage 2B type. You have the tumor infiltrating beyond the capsule and breaching into the, into the mediastinal fat. Okay. And in the stage 2B, you could also have a little bit of adhesion to the pleura, that is your mediastinal pleura or to the mediastinal pericardium, but it should not penetrate through because in that case, it would become stage 3. Now, moving on to the stage 3, here, as you see, the tumor has not only breached into the fat, it has actually gone into the pericardium, right? So, it has penetrated the pericardium, which is in continuity with the mediastinum. Over here, you have a penetration of the pleura, which is in contiguity with the mediastinal tumor. Another important thing that you see in the stage 3 is that there is a penetration of these great vessels. So, invasion of these great vessels and the adjacent structures around the thymic tumor within the mediastinum would all account for a stage 3. Coming to the stage 4a, in the case of stage 4a, an important thing that we are seeing over here is that you have pericardial as well as pleural invasion even over here. But you have these nodules which are separate from that of the primary thymic tumor mass. So, separate pleural and pericardial nodules which are separate from the main tumor mass would actually upstage this particular stage to stage 4a. And moving on to stage 4b, it's actually both lymphomatous as well as hematogenous uh, metastasis. So the, the spread could be by the lymphatics to the perithymic lymph nodes and also to the deep thoracic and the cervical nodes. Or it could be a hematogenous spread with multiple nodules in the lung parenchyma separate from that of the lung, which was in contiguity of the mediastinal tumor because invasion of the lung in contiguity with the mediastinal tumor would actually be stage 3. So this is the modified Masaoka staging, that is the Masaoka Koga staging system, which is also advocated by the CAP protocol. However, an important thing to keep in mind is that the CAP protocol says that this particular staging should be applied only once you have given it a TNM designation. So once you have done a TNM categorization, then you can go ahead and do a modified Masaoka staging system. So as per CAP, you have to have a TNM staging done for thymic epithelial tumors. So you have a stage one in which the tumor is encapsulated both grossly as well as microscopically, meaning that there is no transcapsular invasion microscopically. Moving on to the stage two, we have got a stage 2A where you get a microscopic transcapsular invasion and a stage 2B where you get an invasion into the thymic or the perithymic fat. You have you may have adherence to the mediastinal pleura or the pericardium, but they should not breach, the tumor should not breach the mediastinal pleura or the mediastinal pericardium. In the stage 3, you have got a macroscopic invasion of the neighboring organs in contiguity with the mediastinum. If there is a great vessel involvement, it needs to be mentioned because this have got a worse prognosis. Stage 4 is again differentiated into pleural or pericardial dissemination, that is the stage 4A, or hematogenous or lymphatic dissemination as in the stage 4b. An important thing that you need to know that you need to concentrate on over here is the mention of the fact that there is a capsule around this particular tumor, right? So that's important. We haven't really talked about how the gross appearance of this particular tumor is. So now if you look at this particular picture on the right hand side, you see a very well delineated thymic tumor with a nice capsule all around it. Although I would say that towards the towards this aspect, where I've marked it out in the form of a round circle, you see that there might be a little bit of capsular bridge. So the important thing to keep in mind is that when you are getting a thymic tumor, you have to ink the capsular aspect because identification of a bridge is important as it would upstage your tumor. Now, this is something which is easier said than done because Every now and then, you'll get a tumor which has been removed piecemeal or even worse, something looking like a capsule, a thin capsule. Once you try to section through the tumor, the capsule just strips off. Those are the cases where you will 
find it frustrating and you will you might not probably be able to ink the capsular aspect however an attempt should always be made to ink the external surface so that you could talk about the capsule and the integrity of the capsule now moving on to the tnm classification system as i said the tnm classification system looks a bit like the modified masaoka koga staging system but is exact but is not exactly the same so coming to the pt category you have got a pt0 where there is no evidence of primary tumor now the pt1 category is interesting so if you read through you have encapsulated tumor as well as the tumors which go through the capsule into the into the mediastinal fat and most importantly they may also break through and involve the mediastinal pleura now this is important because the encapsulated tumors would be masaoka koga stage 1 like i said but if you had a capsular breach this would be masaoka koga stage 2a if you had a penetration beyond the capsule into the mediastinal fat this would be masaoka koga 2b and if you had the invasion of the mediastinal pleura this would be masaoka koga stage 3 so as as you see the t1 stage actually encapsulates the 1 2a 2b as well as three stages of the masaoka koga staging system pt2 would be a direct invasion of the pericardium so that is also included in the masaoka koga stage 3 pt3 includes the invasion of all the other organs which are situated in proximity to this mediastinum but most importantly there's a major difference is the fact that masaoka koga stage 3 talks about great vessel involvement within the context of masaoka koga stage 3 however involvement of the great vessel systems as the aorta arch of aorta etc actually puts these tumors in the tnm staging system into the t4 category coming on to the pn category that is the nodal involvement you have got n1 and n2 but let's look at another important thing the masaoka koga stage 4a actually includes the separate pleural and the pericardial nodules and in the tnm classification if you have pleural and pericardial nodules which are separate from your primary tumor that is masaoka koga 4a this goes into the m1a category while the m1b category as well as the nodal involvement category includes both your lymphomatous dissemination that is the masaoka koga 4b and as well as the hematogenous dissemination of the masaoka koga 4b system so as you see as i've already uh, said they look kind of similar but the different categories in the masaoka koga staging system cannot be directly transplanted onto the tnm classification so you need to keep that in mind having talked about the gross appearance the staging systems and a general overview of the thymic epithelial neoplasms we shall now start talking about the histological appearance of these various epithelial neoplasms that we can come across so as i said the thymomas include type a ab b1 b2 and b3 within the context of the ab the b could actually include any one of b1 b2 or the b3 subtypes you also have got a thymic carcinoma which is to be segregated from the b3 by a combination of morphology and ihc so let's look at this first case as you see this particular this particular thymic tumor is a very well circumscribed and an encapsulated one as well and you have got a multi lobulated architecture so you have got multiple tumor tumor lobules of varying sizes throughout uh in, a few important things are apparent even at this particular magnification you have got very prominent cystic change over here and towards the upper right hand corner you have got a net like kind of an appearance which is basically the microcystic architecture even over here you have a very prominent cystic as well as microcystic architecture so these are the cystic zones and adjacent to the cystic zones you have an area which seems to be composed of ovoid to to spindle cells now this spindling is a very important thing that you will have to keep in mind because this type a thymomas are all of the spindle cell category so these are the cystic zones which are filled with proteinaceous fluid and adjacent to that you have got the spindle cell areas you note another important thing there is a shortage of lymphocytes over here so the type a the classic type a thymomas will have less than 10% lymphoid areas if you were to 
take multiple sections from the tumors, you would find that they're actually lymphocyte poor. If more than 10% of the area of the tumor shows presence of lymphocytes, small lymphocytes, these would actually go into the type AB category. We shall be talking about this subsequently. Within the cystic zones, you could sometimes see this kind of papillary aggregates. You also have small, vague gland-like spaces within the tumor. These are the microcystic zones that I talked about. As you can see, there's a lacy, cribriform kind of an architecture within these microcystic zones. And these are your usual ovoid to spindle cells that you see within the cellular areas. You also have hemangiopericytoma-like vessels of staghorn configuration. This is another case of type A thymoma, an excision specimen. As you see, it's a very cellular tumor with a predominantly spindle cell architecture composed of intersecting short fascicles and storyform holes of spindle cells. The spindle cells as such are pretty bland, mildly pleomorphic, not really much of chromatin condensation, not, uh, and, uh, and no prominence of these nucleoli. Mitotic activity seems to be sparse. And also, like I said before, there's a shortage of lymphocytes. You see almost no lymphocytes over there. And that's important because the type A thymomas are lymphocyte poor. And you have got these vague pseudoglandular spaces over here. And if you do IHC, this particular IHC that has been done is pancytokeratin. But this could actually strain with a lot of other cytokeratin, uh, with, a, with a lot of other antibodies like CAM 5.2, P63, P40, CK19, polycronal PAX8, CD, uh, CD205, etc. This is a core biopsy specimen of a thymoma type A. As you see, the cellular portions are composed of rounded to mostly ovoid to elongated, slightly spindle cells. And in the intervening spaces, you have got a lot of hemorrhage. And these spindle cells, once you do an IHC, you see that they're expressing cytokeratin. And most importantly, they're expressing another marker, CD20. This is an important thing that is to be kept in mind. CD20 is a B cell marker, but in the context of the type A thymomas, CD20 is a marker which will be expressed by the epithelial cells. So that's all about the type A thymomas. The type A thymomas, a few important things to be kept in mind. These will be lymphocyte poor, epithelium rich. The epithelial cells will have a spindle-like mesenchymal kind of a morphology, although they will stain with epithelial markers. And most importantly, along with epithelial markers, they will also stain aberrantly with CD20, which is a B-cell marker. Now coming to the thymoma B1 supply. As you see, this shows a pretty well circumscribed tumor with almost a capsule running around it. Another important thing that we note in this particular histology is that it has got a lobulated configuration. And this large lobulated configuration is a kind of an organoid feature, as in it's something which mimics the pediatric thymus. So you see these multiple tumor lobules of varying sizes, which are spread throughout. And another, uh, another interesting thing that you can see over here is that it's got an overall blue look. And as you know, the more blue the appearance, the more lymphocytes you'll see in those areas. In this particular organ, since it's lymphocytes that give rise to the blue color, we can more or less predict that we are going to have a thymoma which is going to be rich in lymphocytes. So you have got these lobules and you've got this deep blue appearance within these lobules composed of sheets of lymphocytes. As you can see, these lymphocytes are the small, dark, hyperchromatic round cells. However, you see that, so, so these are all your lymphocytes. However, you see that in proximity to the lymphocytes, there is a population of cells which are slightly larger, which have got more prominent nucleus with slightly vesicular nuclei and larger with a slightly polygonal kind of an appearance like over here. So these are the epithelial cells which are scattered in between the sheets of these lymphoid cells. So the important thing about type B1 thymoma is that these are lymphocyte rich. Epithelium is seen, but is really not that conspicuous. And WHO sets a sets a criteria that you should have less than three contiguous epithelial cells in order to call it a type B1 thymoma. 
the small lymphocytes will stain with the immature T cell markers. So this will be CD3 positivity and also express TDT along with other markers like CD1A, CD99, CD5, etc. And because these are immature T cell precursors, this will have a high Ki67. On the other hand, on the right hand side, we see the epithelial cells which have been highlighted with antibodies. In this particular case, a pancytokeratin has been done, but you could also highlight them with CAM 5.2, CK19, P63, P40, CK7, etc. So, like I said, an important feature of the type B1 thymomas is that they have an organoid architecture, meaning that they've got a lobulated appearance which resembles more or less that of the pediatric thymus with lots of collagenous septae in between these tumor lobules. Another important thing that you see over here is that there seems to be a kind of a zonation. So you have got a peripheral dark zone, which resembles that of the cortex in the pediatric thymus. And you have got towards the inner aspect, you have got these paler zones, which resemble that of the medulla. So this particular zonation of a dark cortical zone and an inner medullary architecture is what you see characteristically in the case of type B1 thymoma. Let's talk a little bit about IHC, the way that it helps in identifying this particular B1 thymomas. As you see, the first picture shows a kind of a biphasic architecture. So you have got a darker zone towards the right hand side and you have got a paler zone towards the left. The dark zone is actually composed of the proliferating immature T cells, which will be picked up with the TDT. Towards the paler zone, you see that there is a uh, that there's a sparsity of uh, there's a sparseness of these TDT expressing cells. So these are left unstained, the paler zones. So the paler zones towards the medulla will actually have some B cells rather. Another important thing that is to be seen is the proportion of the epithelial cells. As you see in the slide C, you have these epithelial cells which have been highlighted with CK19. An important thing to note is that these epithelial cells are more prominent towards the region of the cortex where the immature T cells are concentrated. Towards the inner pillar region, these cells are present, but not as extensively. And a few of these epithelial cells can also be picked up by utilizing markers like P63. So you see the nuclear positivity over here. Now, moving on to the type AB category. As I said, the type AB category is one where you have got a component of type A. You also have got a type, uh, you also have got a component of type B, which could be any of B1, B2, or the B3 appearance. In this particular case, the slide that I've shown you, that I'm showing you is that of the B1 morphology. So the bulk of the tumor has a type A spindle cell picture. However, towards the center, you see a portion which is slightly darker slightly darker so these are the zones which will be very rich in rich in lymphocytes and like i told you the type a will be a lymphocyte poor tumor uh, will be a lymphocyte poor tumor while the type b that is the type b1 type will have lots of lymphocytes within it as a result you have got two types of tumor within you have got two types of architecture within the same tumor you have got type a and you have got a type b pattern and this warrants a diagnosis of type AB. So as per WHO, you are actually supposed to quantify the various types of thymoma within a certain tumor in 10% increments, like say 10%, 20%, 30% and so. And you are supposed to designate, given your final diagnosis, the, the percentage representation of each particular type of thymic, uh, of thymic tumoral histology that you are seeing. For example, like you could... Call a, you could call a certain thymoma as type B2 with type B3 components. And you have to specify the percentage of the type B2 element. In this particular case, 80% of the tumor in a certain case has been labeled as type B2 and 20% has been labeled as type B3. However, this particular rule does not apply in the case of type AB thymomas because in a case of type AB thymoma, you need not actually give the quantification of the type A and the type B areas. Just appreciating the fact that more than 10% of your tumor shows type B kind of an areas is enough to give a diagnosis of type AB thymoma. You need not actually specify as to this much is the, per, uh, is the percentage of type A and this much the percentage of the type B. 
So in this particular slide, you see, we could actually draw a line through the middle of this slide and we could divide it into two components. So towards the right, you have got the spindle cell areas, which are poor in lymphoid cells. So these are the type A areas. While moving towards the left, you have got these sheets of dark, small, round lymphoid cells. So those are the type B1-like areas, which are lymphocyte rich towards the left. And the spindle cell areas, which are poor in lymphocytes towards the right, are the type A areas. The type B areas have been shown on the left, as you see, lots of small, dark, round lymphoid cells. These are poor in the epithelial cells, while the type A areas are actually, actually you see the opposite thing happening. There's less of lymphocytes and there are more of the spindle cells. However, the spindle cells, as I've told you already, they are actually the epithelial cells which express a, which show a spindle cell phenotype. However, on IHC, this will be picked up with epithelial markers like pancytokeratin, CK19, P63, etc. So this is, uh, so in this particular case, you see uh, there are these areas which are spindle cell areas running through the middle of the tumor, but then you have got lymphocyte rich areas also, which have, which are basically the type A areas. So you have, I mean, type B areas. So you have the type B areas and the type A areas juxtaposed. So this kind of tumor, this kind of thymic, thymic tumors will get a designation of type AB thymoma. Another architecture seen in the case of type AB thymoma, like in this particular case, is where you have the microcystic architecture of the type A in juxtaposition to areas which look like lymphocyte-rich type B, that is the B1 kind of an architecture. As you see towards the left, you have got the type B, that is the lymphoid-rich B1 pattern. And towards the right, you have got the microcystic spindle cell pattern of the type A areas. So IHC with TDT is a very important, TDT is a very important marker by which we can segregate a type A from the type AB thymic tumors. So in the case of type A, you should have less than 10% of areas picked up with TDT. Like for example, if you see the C picture, you see that there's actually not, not much of staining going on over here. So it's very poor in lymphocytes, TDT. So TDT is basically the marker of the immature T cells that you see. We can thus say that in the case of the image C, there's not much of these immature lymphocytes. So this is pure spindle cell pattern of type A. Going to the first picture, that is the A, you see actually a large proportion of lymphocytes which have been picked up by TDT. So this actually classify as B category, most likely B1. So these are not A. You don't get this many, uh, you, you will never get this many lymphocytes in the case of a type A thymoma. The second one actually is kind of dicey. You have got a slight expression of TDT. You have got a smattering of TDT expressing cells. So you need to scan more of the areas. And if on eyeballing, if on final eyeballing, you reached your impression that more than 10% of the areas which have been examined show this kind of TDT expression, you would have to call it AB. If less than 10% of the total areas scanned show this kind of TDT expressing cells, this would go into the type A. This particular set of images basically shows you the way the, the thymic epithelial cells versus the lymphocytes can be quantified. All of these are actually examples of pure type A thymomas. The h &E images are shown on the left, while the TDT in order to pick up the intervening lymphocytes is shown on the right. As you see, the first one has almost no lymphocytes. So this is a pure type A thymoma. Type B and type C are showing moderate expression of TDT expressing immature T cells. However, this is just one, one field. You will actually need to see a big area with TDT. And if more than 10% of those areas showed you this kind of expression, especially the one that you see in the C image, then you might be tempted to call it a type AB thymoma. Going on to the images D and E. So as I said, the D image is something which shows a slightly higher expression, almost a moderate range of expression of TDT expressing lymphocytes. This is something which is bordering the AB, AB category. 
in the last image, that is the E, you see a whole lot of lymphocytes which can be picked up even on a H and E, right? All the small dark round cells. And of course, if you do a TDT, you will have a quite a high expression of TDT within this particular lymphoid cells. And of course, with this much of high TDT expression, you can never call it a type A pure thymoma. So this will have to have the diagnosis of type AB thymoma given to it because there's an abundance of the lymphoid cells. And abundance of lymphoid cells is never a property of type of the pure type A thymoma. An important differential diagnosis of the type AB thymoma is something which is known as a metaplastic thymoma. And as you see, the first image, you have spindle cell areas which look like the type A pattern. You have got these intervening areas of slightly polygonal cells with a smattering of lymphocytes which give you a type B kind of an appearance. Uh, there are a few important uh, important things that you need to keep in mind about the metaplastic thymomas. Most importantly, this particular this particular form of thymoma has been recently described to have this particular translocation YAP1 and the MAMLT2 gene, which in turn can be picked up with fish. So this particular break apart fish, which has been shown in the third picture, basically shows that you have this normal gene you have this normal chromosome where the two where the two gene uh, i mean where the two genes are actually together while the chromosome which has which has broken apart shows that the two probes have been separated from each other so this could be utilized in order to diagnose a metaplastic thymoma moving on to the the type b2 thymoma let's talk a little bit about the overall generalizations. Like I said already, thymomas often tend to be circumscribed, well circumscribed and even encapsulated and they tend to have a lobulated kind of a configuration. I guess we are seeing both over here. We see a kind of a encapsulation towards the periphery. We also see a lobation with intervening fibrocollagenous septae, which is seen. However, an important thing to note is that the lobes over here at some places, they tend to have a kind of a diffuse configuration. So that lobation and at some places, these lobes are very small. So that normal lobation that you saw in the case of a pediatric thymus, that seems to have changed, that seemed to have changed somewhat. And as a result, this particular thymoma is moving away from the classical organoid architecture of what we saw in the case of the B1 thymoma. The overall appearance is, however, still blue. And that means that this is a particular thymoma which will have a dense population of lymphocytes. However, an important distinction between the type B1 and B2 thymoma is that in B2, there's an increasing representation of the thymic epithelial cells. So by definition, you should have more than or equal to three contiguous epithelial cells in order to call a certain thymoma as B2 subtype. As you see, within the tumoral lobules, you have a dense blue appearance. However, at some places, the dense blue pattern is actually broken up by paler areas. We'll look into this subsequently in higher detail. As you see, towards the left, you have this very small dark round lymphoid cells, which can be picked up just by your naked eye as lymphocytes. However, in proximity to these lymphocytes, in almost trabecular fashion, as well as in nests, you have cells which are much more large, round, polygonal, with moderate to abundant cytoplasm, with a vesicular nucleus and a focally pinpoint nucleolus. So these are your epithelial cells. And you probably don't need IHC for this, but you can say that these epithelial cells are actually in contiguity. So there are more than three epithelial cells sitting next to each other. So this kind of clustering of the epithelial cells would actually shift the diagnosis from a type B1 towards a type B2 category. So you have these lymphocytes, the small dark round ones, and the large paler polygonal cells are the epithelial cells. And the same thing can actually be highlighted by IHC. Like you see, the epithelial cells have been highlighted by pancytokeratin while the small lymphocytes are highlighted with CD3 and the immature marker of the lymphocyte, that is TDT.
An important difference between the type B1 and the type B2 thymoma is that the thymus-like pattern is more consistently seen in the case of type B1 thymoma. The confluence of the epithelial cells, that is the clustering of more than equal to three epithelial cells is something which is seen only in the case of B2 thymoma. And most importantly, these paler medullary islands, which I talked about in the context of B1 thymoma, will not be usually seen in the case of the B2 category. Moving on to the third category, that is the thymoma of the B3 subtype, WHO subtype. As you see, this particular tumor is the particular lobation that we have seen priorly is not that well developed. In fact, this area, in this area, you see that the, the cells are in a more are arranged in a more diffuse sheet like kind of, uh, like kind of a configuration. Another important thing that you can pick up at this power is that the overall color of this particular tumor is pink. And that means that this will have less of lymphocytes and much, much more representation of the epithelial cells. So if you see the image on the right, you have diffuse sheets of epithelial cells, large polygonal, which we'll be seeing in the subsequent slide, sheets of polygonal epithelial cells. And the most important clinching point is the atypia. As you see, the cells are showing mild to moderate amounts of pleomorphism. They have got prominent nucleoli, nuclear contour irregularity, and significant amount of pleomorphism is seen in some of these cells. So this kind of atypia immediately upstages your category of B2 towards the B3, B3 category. So the B3 category will does have a less lobulated architecture. It, should, it will have a more more diffuse sheet like pattern it will be very very lymphocyte poor it will have mostly sheets diffuse sheets of epithelial cells which will show some amount of mild to moderate amount of atypia at some places these cells look like squamoid cells polygonal squamoid cells however most importantly unlike the squamous cells they don't have intercellular bridges and cytokeratin would show a dense diffuse expression of cytokeratin throughout as you do not have much of lymphocytes in this particular subtype of thymic, of thymic tumor. Around the, uh, this PVS here refers to the perivascular space. So a low power distinction between the type B2 and the B3 would be that like, like what I've already said, the B2 types of thymomas give you an overall blue appearance, while the B3 ones give you a pink appearance. So the B2 type is lymphocyte rich, the B3 type is lymphocyte poor and epithelium rich. And if you are to do cytokeratin, pancytokeratin, or for that matter, you could do CK19, right? You could do a CAM 5.2, whatever. If you do an epithelial marker, you would see that the expression of this epithelial marker is much, much more stronger in the case of B2 as well as in the case of B3, while in the case of the B1, you, you do have expression of these epithelial markers, but there is a there are lots of areas where you do not have this marker expression, meaning that these are the areas which will be rich in lymphocytes rather than epithelial cells. And so we have already gone over the B1, B2, and the B3. Talking about the group A, that is the type A, you see that there is a dense expression of the pancytokeratin because the type A, the type A subtype is actually almost entirely devoid of lymphocytes. These are just composed of epithelial cells with a spindle appearance. So you have a dense positivity which is picked up within the spindle cells by the pancytokeratin. The second picture is that of an AB category. So in the case of this particular AB category of thymoma, you see that there are these spindle cell areas which are very, very rich in the cytokeratin, while these intervening bluish areas are those of the B architecture where there is an abundance of lymphocytes and less, and less representation of the epithelial elements. So this is the characteristic histology of the type B3 thymomas. The, the lobulated organoid architecture is almost gone. You have got diffuse sheets of cells which are slightly more pleomorphic and atypical compared to what you get in the case of B1 or the B2 thymomas. CK19 shows that these cells which are arranged in diffuse sheets are basically epithelial, and they also have got a high proliferative fraction within this epithelial cell population. 
This is another case of type B3 thymoma. You can definitely appreciate the atypia within this epithelial rich form of the thymic tumor. The lymphocytes are comparatively less. CD20 shows a smattering of B cells throughout. But the most important one important marker which is shown at the end is CD5. Now CD5 is basically a T cell marker. You do have a few T cells over here towards the left which have been picked up with CD5. But you see that there is a intense membrane positivity within the polygonal epithelial cell population as well. And this is an important thing to note. Some of your B3 category of thymomas will express CD5. And this is important because CD5 is utilized as one of the markers for thymic carcinoma. So this is a diagnostic fit. Uh, so this is a diagnostic pitfall. You will need to analyze your CD5 in order to separate a thymic carcinoma from a B3 thymoma, always in combination with other markers like CD117, because a small proportion of B3 thymomas could actually also express CD5. The last of these tumors is the thymic carcinoma. In this particular, the, and the commonest type of thymic carcinoma is the thymic squamous cell carcinoma. And this squamous cell carcinoma, the thymic, the primary thymic squamous cell carcinoma is actually very, very difficult to separate from the B3 kind of thymoma sometimes. So the new WHO blue book says that in case you have gone through the tumor and you see that there are areas which you suspect to be thymic carcinoma in a background of what looks like, say, for example, a B3 thymoma, you are supposed to mention the fact that there is a thymic carcinoma. You are supposed to give the percentage of the thymic carcinoma. And then you are supposed to list out the remaining thymoma components based upon the proportional representation of that particular thymoma category. So over here, the architecture is really not lobulated, right? You have the, the tumor mostly spread apart in the form of diffuse sheets. You seem to have an invasive front towards the periphery. And the overall color is pink, meaning that this is going to be an epithelial rich tumor without much of lymphocytic representation. As you see at a higher power, the cells are round to polygonal with pale to eosinophilic cytoplasm, well-defined cell borders with almost a squamoid appearance, but not exactly squamous because they don't have intercellular bridges. Keratin is also not that well seen. These cells are atypical. They have at least moderate amount of atypia. I would say at some places the atypia seems to be quite significant. Mitotic activity is also increased. And most importantly, on the right-hand side, you see a bizarre tripolar mitosis. Now, this is something which will not be seen in the context of a B3 thymoma. That clinches this, this particular diagnosis towards a thymic carcinoma, towards the primary thymic carcinoma. So let's talk about IHC in the context of the primary thymic carcinomas. As I said, there is no, no single marker which will be enough to pick up a thymic carcinoma. You will, use, you will need to use multiple markers together. Like I said already, B3 thymomas can sometimes express CD5, which is talked about as a thymic carcinoma marker. So you will have to at least use a combination of CD5 and CD117. A combined expression of CD5 and CD117 in the context of a thymic neoplasms. Neoplasm, which looks like a carcinoma, actually corroborates the diagnosis. So you can call something, you can call an atypical thymic tumor as a thymic carcinoma if it shows co-expression of CD5 with CD117. Along with that, you also have expression of markers like EZH2. And uh, EMA is sometimes expressed within this particular group of tumors. And another important differential diagnosis for these thymic carcinomas is a primary lung carcinoma, say, for example, a primary squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, which has gone and invaded the thymus. So FOXN1 and CD205 are two important markers to be utilized in that context because they will be expressed in the case of the thymic carcinomas, but they will not be expressed in the case of pulmonary squamous cell carcinomas. And speaking of the epithelial markers, it's really not that useful because, you know, the range of epithelial marker expression is the same across all the types of thymomas extending up to the thymic carcinomas. So whatever epithelial marker you do, uh, your PAN-CK uh, or CK818, CK19, P40, P63, it's expected to be positive in a case of thymic carcinoma. 
So this particular study talked about some of the important diagnostic features by which you can classify a thymic neoplasm as a thymic carcinoma. So atypia is one of the most important things. By clear-cut atypia, you would mean something more than moderate atypia. So presence of things like atypical mitotic figures definitely helps. You would also need to exclude some of the other categories of thymomas like thymomas with atypia or those with anaplastic features. You will need to rule out the thymic neuroendocrine tumors and also metastasis to the, to the thymus and also germ cell neoplasms of the thymus. Once you have eliminated those possibilities and once you have done IHC and established the fact that there is sparsity of the TDT expressing T cells and also there is increased epithelial, like, uh, I mean, co-expression of CD5 with CD117, along with expression of markers like GLUT1, you can call this particular, uh, I mean, you can call a particular tumor as type as the as a thymic carcinoma. However, the distinction of B3 thymomas from thymic carcinomas is a challenging one. And oftentimes, you will run into diagnostic problems. So blank slate, but let's recapitulate the facts that we already know. So let's talk about the type A. As we have already seen, type A is mostly composed of neoplastic spindled epithelial cells with low-grade nuclear features, giving rise to a fascicular storyform pattern with hemangiopericytoma-like staghorn vessels, oftentimes seen. And these cells will express all kinds of thymic epithelial markers, along with markers like CD205 and FOXN1. Most importantly, aberrant expression of CD20 will be often seen in these particular tumors. Unlike thymic carcinomas, this will be negative for CD5 and CD117. Atypia may be present, but this atypia will not have any prognostic significance. We'll talk a little bit more about the atypia later. You will get cystic, microcystic change. You will get intertumoral uh, glandular differentiation. You will get papillae, rosettoid configuration, etc. Small lymphocytes should, by definition, in the case of type A, be sparse. If more than 10% of your tumor shows immature TDT expressing T cells, you are probably dealing with the AB thymoma. And also, if you see intervening dense lymphoid areas, that would also point towards the diagnosis of a type AB thymoma. The important differential diagnosis of the type A thymoma is basically most of the other spindle cell tumors that can happen in the region of the mediastinum. So you have the solitary fibrous tumor or monophasic, uh, or monophasic fibrous synovial sarcoma or metaplastic thymomas. All of these spindle cell kind of tumors could actually come into the differential diagnosis of a type A thymoma. Now talking about atypia, atypia in the context of a type A thymoma basically means cytological atypia along with necrosis sometimes. Necrosis might have some prognostic relevance. Uh, as a result, although we say that the atypia overall does not have much of a prognostic significance in the type A, it's important to really be sure that you are talking of a type A thymoma before saying that this atypia is not really significant. So this particular genetic uh, so this particular mutation testing of the GTF2I gene is an important ancillary diagnostic test which can be utilized to establish a diagnosis of a type A thymoma. We shall be talking a little bit more about the genetic landscape in the context of the thymic neoplasms in the subsequent slide. Now coming on to the type B1 thymomas, like I said, it's a blue appearing tumor, meaning that there will be dense sheets of immature lymphocytes and this will have an organoid architecture resembling that of the pediatric thymus. The lymphocytes will be much, much more represented compared to the organal epithelial cells, which, which will be few and dispersed in between. And by definition, by de uh, and by WHO definition, this should be less than three if seen in continuity. They will have round to oval nuclei, they'll have pale chromatin, and they'll have small nucleoli. So the T, uh, the cells, these uh, like these lymphoid cells, will be basically immature T cells. So these are TDT expressing T cells. You will have a few B cells concentrated within the medullary zone, and the epithelial cells will be basically picked up with all kinds of epithelial markers, like I've already said. But unlike the type A thymomas, in the case of type B, these will not express CD20. So the differential diagnosis of type B1 thymoma, as you can imagine, it's a thymoma which is very rich in immature lymphoid cells, highly proliferative, mitotically active immature lymphoid cells. So on a small biopsy, an acute T cell, acute lymphoblastic lymphoma will be a major differential diagnosis. 
this differential diagnostic problem should not arise in a case of a excised specimen. Similarly, thymic hyperplasia is also another important differential diagnosis. Now coming to the type B2, as you move over from the type B1 towards the type B2, you still have the blue coloration. That is, this, this particular subtype is lymphocyte-rich, but you have a much higher representation of these polygonal epithelial cells that we had talked about. You will have at least three cells in continuity, and these cells will also have nuclear atopy in the form of vesicular nuclei and prominent nucleoli. And uh, about the immunophenotype, it's the same as we have already seen. The abundant small lymphocytes are actually immature T cells, so they have TDT expression. And you have a few B cells which are concentrated in the region of the medulla. However, compared to the type B1, which has a characteristic organoid appearance with the characteristic outer dark cortex and inner pale medulla, type B2, the corticomedullary distinction is not that conspicuous. The epithelial cells, which are much much more represented in the case of type B2 thymoma will be picked up with epithelial markers and will not express CD20 unlike type A. So you see the proportion of the polygonal epithelial cells is an important differential uh, point by which you can separate a type B1 from a type B2 category. If you have, if IHC shows that at least three, three of the cells are in continuity in foci, then your diagnosis basically gets changed over from type B1 to type B2, meaning that in if you had a type B1 tumor, where in areas you are seeing a large number of epithelial cells in, uh, in continuity, which kind of fits in with the type B2 picture, you would have to give a combined diagnosis of WHO B1, B2 type, and you will have to give the percentage representation of each of these particular variants within this particular tumor. The percentage of the B1 areas and the percentage of the B2 areas. Moving on to the type B3. The type B3, as I said, is a lymphocyte poor and epithelium rich tumor. So you'll have dense diffuse sheets of epithelial, polygonal epithelial cells. You will have almost no lymphocytes over here. And as a result, it will overall give you a pink kind of an appearance. And within the sheets of this polygonal epithelial cells, you will see that there is significant amount of atypia. The cells will have up to moderate, uh, up to moderate degree of atypia. They will have clear to eosinophilic cytoplasm. But unlike the important differential diagnosis of squamous carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, these will not have intracellular bridges. These will express the usual epithelial markers, but most importantly, the most important differential diagnosis of type B3 is a thymic carcinoma. So unlike thymic carcinoma, these will usually not express CD5, CD117, EZH2, etc. However, keep in mind that a certain proportion of type B3 thymomas can express CD5, and as a result, you will always have to do multiple markers to rule out a thymic carcinoma. The same dictum that we saw priorly, if on IHC you were to get areas where you had diffuse sheets of epithelial cells in a tumor which otherwise looks like a type B2 thymoma, you will have to call it a combined B2, B3 thymoma. And you will have to give a percentage representation of the B2 areas and the B3 areas separately. There is an important thing to be kept in mind about the B2 and the B3 thymomas. As you go on from A to B1 and then towards B2 and B3, you see that there's an increased chances of capsular invasion and invasion of the adjacent tissues. The chances of capsular invasion and perithymic invasion is maximum in the case of type B2 as well as the type B3 thymomas. And these are often associated with translocations of KMT2A, MAML2 genes. Now we'll talk a little bit about the molecular categories of thymoma. As you see, we have talked about the, the type A, the type AB, and the type uh, and the type which kind of morphologically mimics that of the thymic carcinomas. So you have got type A, type AB, and the B, B type of thymomas. If we are to talk about a molecular genetic point of view, you see that within the A and the AB-like clusters, there is a bit of a commonality. You have mutations in the GTF2I gene in both the clusters. You also have overexpression of C19MC. I shall be talking about this C19MC alteration subsequently. So these two things are something which is common across the A and the AB-like subtypes. 
Moving on to the other pathways, the P53 pathway is actually preserved in the case of the A-like cluster. So that's a good thing. And the cell proliferation pathways which feature transcription factors like MYC, these are actually down-regulated. So that's a good thing as well. So down-regulation of MYC along with MYB and up-regulation of the anti-tumoral P53 pathway are all present in A-like cluster. In the AB-like cluster, although G2F2I mutation and C19MC expression is present, you see that there is a down-regulation of the P53 pathway, meaning that there is a loss of P53 protein, and that's a poor thing. That's a poor prognostic thing. MYB is upregulated, and that is something which is worrisome as well. In the B-like cluster, you also have a downregulation of the P53 pathway and an upregulation of the oncogenic pathways like MYC and MYB. So that means that the tumors which segregate to the B type, especially the B2 and the B3, will be associated with alterations in the P53 pathway as well as upregulation of the tumor inducing MYC pathway. And that's something which is worrisome. Moving to the last cluster, that is the thymic carcinoma-like cluster, you see the same sequence of events. You see that the P53 pathway is actually down-regulated and there is an up-regulation of the oncogenic MYC and the MYB pathways. So the A and the AB categories, that is most of the A the most of the A cases and a portion of the AB cases are actually good prognostic ones, while a good number of the B-like cluster and obviously the, the thymic carcinoma-like clusters have got poor molecular signatures in the form of a dysregulated P53 pathway and upregulated MYC and MYB pathways. Now moving on to the C19MC expression, which is seen in both the type A and the type AB-like clusters. This is basically transcriptional overexpression of a microRNA cluster within the region of the 19Q13. Um, and this is termed as C19MC alteration. And this alteration is something which is seen in both the A and the AB type of thymomas, resulting in downstream activation of the PI3K AKT mTOR pathway. And you can have targeted chemotherapy, which is directed against this particular pathway. So that's got a treatment benefit as well. Uh, an important thing to be kept in mind is that all, so you see that there's a lot of genetic alterations which is talked about in the context of the thymic neoplasms. And this, all these genetic uh, abnormalities will be actually exposed by, uh, by the advanced technologies like next generation sequencing or DNA promoter methylation assay. And most importantly, the type B2 and the B3 thymomas, which have got the aggressive histology as well as aggressive behavior, are associated with, with translocations of KMT2A, MAML2, like I've already said priorly. So this is the last slide of the discussion. The, this, this particular slide basically summarizes all we have talked about. That is a morphological approach to how you would like to, as to how you will categorize the various types of thymomas. Okay, so the two important things that you will need to analyze are firstly, the portion of the lymphoid representation and the portion of the epithelial cell representation. So if you have a lymphocyte poor tumor, and if you see that the epithelial cell type is overall represented in a much higher proportion, you would have to consider a type B3 thymoma, but you will also need to keep the possibility of a thymic carcinoma, as well as neuroendocrine tumors and non-thymic tumors, which might have invaded the thymus. If you have a prominent lymphoid population, check out as to what the representation of the epithelial component is. Use, if you see that the epithelial cell type is spindled rather than rounded polygonal epithelioid appearance, then you will have to consider type A or type AB thymoma. But don't forget that some cases of neuroendocrine tumors of the thymus could have a spindled appearance. So that also needs to be there in the differential. And if your thymic tumor has got predominantly epithelioid kind of epithelial cells, you will need to do an eyeballing along with a judicious use of IHC markers, mostly TDT and a pancytokeratin in order to see the representation of the lymphoid versus the epithelial cells. So if you have much more of lymphoid cells and almost non-existent epithelial cells of less than three, of less than three contiguous epithelial cells, then you would call it a type B1 thymoma. If you have 
more than or equal to three epithelial cells in continuity and still a large proportion of lymphoid cells, you'd call it type B2. And if you have sh sheets of, uh, of epithelial polygonal cells and very, very sparse representation of lymphoid cells, you'd call it a type B3 thymoma. So this brings us to the end of this particular discussion. I hope this particular topic, uh, this particular topic has addressed many of the issues we have um, that we have a problem with. Most importantly, the staging of thymic neoplasms and how to separate the various types of thymomas between A, AB, B1, and B2, and B3. Thank you.